This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, Thursday marks the first anniversary of the deadly January 6th insurrection, when thousands of people attacked the U.S. Capitol with the goal of overthrowing the 2020 election. Many were part of far-right extremist and white supremacist groups. Today, we look at where these movements are now, with an investigation by Frontline, ProPublica and Berkeley Journalism's investigative reporting program. Uh, that began in the wake of the deadly 2017 Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. In their reporting, they found many white supremacist groups started to splinter amidst the backlash following Charlottesville. But President Trump gave them new life. This is an excerpt from American Insurrection with correspondent A.C. Thompson that actually begins before January 6, 2021, on November 14th, one week after the presidential election was called for Joe Biden. Trump supporters took to the streets of Washington, D.C., stirred up by Trump's refusal to concede. They demanded the results be overturned. As night falls, Proud Boys merge with MAGA marchers and roam the city looking for fights. Trump supporters confront journalists, vandalize Black Lives Matter signs. activists who try to stop them. A month later, Trump supporters take to the streets of Washington again, and once again, the protests turn violent. And then, he calls his supporters to the Capitol on January 6th. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing, and we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. As the clock runs out on his presidency, he urges them towards the Capitol building. Cowboys are here, but they aren't wearing their trademark yellow and black. The Boogaloo Boys are here, too, also out of uniform. They both blend into the pro-Trump crowd. Inside, Congress is trying to certify the election. Outside, the crowd is bearing down on them. Police on the steps are outnumbered and unprepared. officers are injured. One officer, Brian Sicknick, will later die. A proud boy from New York State smashes through a window. The Capitol has been breached. President, willing to embrace an insurrectionary violence that was once confined only to the most extreme elements of the far right. Bewildered, some wander through the halls. Others move towards the Senate chamber. 
police struggle to hold them off, while Congress members flee through back exits. The mob surges through the hallways, searching for them, coming within feet of their targets. Rioters try to break into a hallway that lawmakers are escaping through. A protester is shot and killed. Three other rioters die in the mayhem. It would be hours before the Capitol was cleared. Now, in an update to the documentary American Insurrection that came out this week, frontline correspondent A.C. Thompson examines how far-right extremist groups have evolved since January 6 and the threat they pose today. In Washington, D.C., the fences are gone. So are the National Guard patrols. The city no longer feels like a war zone. I come back to the Capitol almost a year later, there are many questions that remain unanswered. We cannot allow what happened on January 6 to ever happen again. We owe it to the American people, and we will not fail, I assure you, in that responsibility. The House of Representatives has impaneled a committee to investigate January 6th and to recommend changes that will prevent something like that from happening again. Representative Benny Thompson is the committee chair. January 6th uh, was a difficult day for me personally because I was in the Capitol. I've seen a lot of people come to this Capitol. Uh, people have uh, the ability, I thought, in Washington, D.C., to express themselves regardless of position. But if I ever imagine that somebody would invade the United States Capitol. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that would occur. Despite what all had occurred, we were called back in the early morning hours to complete the certification. Because if we don't certify the election, then Donald Trump is still president. Mm. And he can do a number of things. Martial law is a, a, a potential. Uh, it could have been something looking like a coup. <laughs> Absolutely. You get people who I talk to on a daily basis who will actually tell me that what I saw and experienced on January 6th really didn't happen. People come to you and they say, oh. January 6th didn't happen. Yeah, it, it, it said, look, uh, it was the Black Lives uh, Matter folk. It was Antifa. Uh, dressed up as Trump people who did that. Or, in addition to that, you have those millions of folk who are out there who are convinced that those individuals who broke into the United States Capitol, they were some of the greatest patriots. Right, right. They, they say these are heroes. That's right. They say that people like you are the enemy. Absolutely. And that's why our mission on this committee uh, is so important. Thompson's committee has subpoenaed members of Trump's inner circle and interviewed hundreds of witnesses, including some D.C. and Capitol Police officers. The fence came down and still nothing has changed. If a hitman is hired and he kills somebody, not only does the hitman go to jail, but the person who hired them does. There was an attack carried out on January 6th, and a hitman sent them. I want you to get to the bottom of that. Those windows up there, those were some of the first windows that were smashed. That door, they were able to breach that door. Um, the, the big one up the steps. Up, yeah, up the steps right there. Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn walks me through what happened that day. I was on the other side of the Capitol. Once I cleared like this tree line right here, I was just looking out and I just couldn't believe what I saw. There were flashbangs going off. There were smoke grenades going off. Um, from your side or from the other side? Both. From both. I've never seen anything like that before. 
my number one thought was just to survive that day, just to survive. At that time, we had no clue what was going on. We were fighting for our lives, for fighting for democracy. And how was this going to end? Like, Because we were hours and hours and hours and it's got to like, end somehow. How was it going to end? And did you think, like, it might end with these guys overrunning this yeah, place? Yeah, it crossed my mind. So I was interviewing recently uh, an elected public official. And he was here. He said, I think maybe that was an Antifa event. It was meant to make Republicans and Trump supporters, MAGA people look bad. W what do you think when you hear stuff like that? And he was here. The rioters that day in the building told us that Donald Trump sent us. I don't know how to make that any more clear to anybody. Now, whether Donald Trump gave what they've been saying as the marching orders, whether he did or not, whatever, that's not, that's not my job. I just know what I experienced. I know what I went through. And they were there because Donald Trump sent them, according to them. Donald Trump sent us. After the attack, we tried to get information from the Justice Department about its investigation and the people who'd been arrested. Along with other news organizations, ProPublica sued for access to evidence they'd been gathering. Trump called us, Trump called us, did you see? I thought that there was gonna be battles across the country. I thought that there was gonna be fighting. I kept thinking that we're gonna go to like a civil war. In late November 2021, the DOJ made public its interrogation of Daniel Rodriguez, who'd admitted to assaulting a police officer. What do you want me to tell you? That I, I taste them? Yes. I thought we were going to do something. I thought that it was not going to happen like that. I thought that Trump was the state president. Rodriguez has pleaded not guilty, and his lawyers have argued that he was manipulated by the agents. But his words echo the narratives I've heard before. We felt that they stole the election. We, did, we, thought they, we felt that they stole this country, that, that it's gone, it's wiped out. America is over, it's destroyed now. The arrests after January 6th may have quieted the movement for a time, but it would turn out to be short-lived. In rallies across the country, I see momentum building around overturning the 2020 election. The crowds include fewer of the characters and groups I've been tracking. I see more and more mainstream Americans. According to polling data, around two-thirds of Republicans have come to believe that the 2020 elections were stolen. About a third say violence may be necessary to save the country. I go back to talk to Mary McCord. What do you think has happened to those organized groups now, the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys, the militias? Uh, like, where are they at in terms of strength at this point? Well, within days, literally days, they started finger pointing, some dissolved, some reconstituted themselves. You know, I think the three percenters said, we are no longer, and you had all these three percenters national saying, okay, we need to find another group. Um, and they also started, you know, making up other disinformation, like this was all an Antifa plot. This was a law enforcement plot. But, you know, Americans have really short memory, and time has passed. Many months have passed now, and we're starting to see, at least in the social media and online forums, you know, uh, organizing again in very dangerous ways. So the, the movement lives on. It does live on, and and you know, in a way, it's harder to for law enforcement to deal with when it's so disparate like that, right? You know, a dozen individuals going to a, a local school board meeting in a rural county without a big police force—that's harder to protect against than the capital, right? The capital will not suffer an insurrection like that again. Where do you see the threats coming from at this point and, and into the future? What keeps you up at night? Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a lot of the threats I still see coming from disinformation, uh, getting into our political discourse. Um, and particularly as we come into another election year, what I'm really seeing is all, you know, the seeds are just being planted already of fraud th rampant throughout our election systems. Polling on this issue is 
pretty chilling. There are tens of millions of Americans that absolutely believe that the 2020 election was a fraud, and a lot of them have said, I'm willing to use violence to change things. First of all, it's astounding to see that data, um, and, I, and I tell myself sometimes that surely there's something wrong about the, that data collection, and that some of that is hy hyperbolic, right? All of that said, you know, we know that gun purchases were up dramatically over 2020. We've seen more and more armed individuals coming out to government proceedings, whether it's the counting of the vote after the elections, whether it's public health meetings, you know, school board meetings, um, the willingness to be threatening government officials and even threatening them with arms is, um, you know, is something that really needs to be addressed because that could just uh, snowball. A year later, the country is still living in the shadow of January 6th. The trail that began for me in Charlottesville has taken another turn. Along the way, I've seen up close the peril posed by a resurgent white supremacist movement, our militias pledging to execute police and elected officials, ultra-nationalists brawling in the streets, would-be revolutionaries wearing Hawaiian shirts, and now this, millions of people convinced that the 2020 election was a fraud, some of them angry enough to turn to violence. Charlottesville on January 6th had once seemed like bookends to an era, but today it's clear. The movements I've been covering have been changing, evolving, but they are not going away. That's an excerpt from the updated version of the American Insurrection documentary with correspondent A.C. Thompson that was released this week. You can watch the full report at pbs.org slash frontline uh, and on YouTube. For more, we're joined by the director and writer of this documentary, Rick Rowley. He's also the director of their Emmy-winning series, Documenting Hate. Rick. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Uh, so, you now have this updated version of American insurrection, where you look at these white supremacist and extremist uh, militias, if you will, um, and where they are today. What do you think is most important to understand about what we've learned in this last year? Um, it's, it's great to be with you, Amy and Juan. Um, yeah, I mean, I think— you know, Mary McCord does a good job of uh, of summing up where the movement has landed at this particular moment. I mean, there was a, a real backlash against uh, um, the perpetrators of January 6th in the immediate weeks afterwards, just as there was a backlash after Charlottesville. And so some of the big above-ground national groups splintered, um, uh, but that backlash was really short-lived. And uh, over the course of the next months, they reconstituted themselves. Mostly, the national networks have disarticulated themselves, and they're being organized locally. So, you know, Proud Boys chapters showing up at school board meetings around the country. Um, and the, the locus of the organizing had sh has shifted in many ways from a national platform to a local one, which makes it, you know, more difficult to track and—, and increases the potential for local or regional violence, which was already a trajectory we're seeing, right, with— um, uh, the plot to kidnap uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, la uh, last year. Um, so, so that is really where the kind of you know threat is now. I think for right wing violence, but I think it's important also to remember that, like, think of these things as uh, of this as a far right social movement. So you have you know groups inside it, small. Uh, committed militant groups like, you know, lifelong white supremacist organizations or um, militias that are, you know, committed to, uh, you know, catalyzing a civil war now. You have those groups that are always sort of pushing the envelope, uh, but they're swimming in a sea of a much larger group of people, millions of people who, uh, you know, in the words of the national security analysts, are, uh, are vulnerable to radicalization. Um, you know, a sea of people who are uh, who are on the edge and could be recruited into violence by these groups. Um, and that pool of people, of radicalizable people, of vulnerable people, is just growing bigger and bigger and bigger. More people today believe that uh, the election was stolen than believed it on the morning of January 6th. More people today believe that violence might be necessary to uh, defend America um, than believed it on the morning of January 6th. So that um, broader kind of 
uh, milieu that these movements and that this violence is generated inside has only gotten bigger. And Rick, I wanted to ask you, you, you did get a chance to uh, interview Congress member Benny Thompson, who's chairing the House uh, in, uh, investigation of uh, the January 6th insurrection, his committee. Uh, that all the attention has been focused in the media in recent uh, months, really, on will Trump and his circle be able to draw out the demands uh, or the subpoenas for investigation uh, uh, into the the next election season? Uh, what is your what was your sense of how of Thompson's resolve and what his committee is uh, has already found and is seeking to? Uh, prove. Well, uh, um, Representative Thompson said that uh, you know January is going to be a big month for them. Uh, they're going to start to you know make much of the work that the committee's been doing in private. It's going to become public, and there'll be more public hearings, and we'll be, begin to see you know what what is uh, what's going on there. I mean, I think um, the, I mean a danger that I I fear is that uh, you know this folk, so Trump obviously played a key role and and has. You know, over the entire course of the this rise in far right violence from before Charlottesville through today, a key player in that and a catalyst for these organizations has been uh, Trump, his candidacy first, and then his pre presidency, uh, and then you know, obviously on the morning of January sixth, is he pointed to the Capitol um, uh, and said, you know, you've got to fight. Um, so uh, you know, his role is absolutely key, but I think it's important for us to remember that um, you know it doesn't. It doesn't have to be a smoke-filled room with three people who, like, you know, uh, planned the, a very sophisticated operation. I mean, what uh, what you have is, you know, currents like a, a deeper political sicknesses inside America that are being and fault lines and fissures that are being tapped into, um, you know, cynically sometimes by by political players that make this, uh, you know, moments like this kind of happen. Um, so, you know, I mean. And there's there's many things that make this a moment that is incredibly ripe for far right mobilization and populist mobilization. I mean, uh, you know, things that create this large volume of problems are, um, you know, the rampant economic inequality of our moment, uh, um, the uh, you know the disastrous wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, those were both major elements in creating a, 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 a large chunk of the population that has lost faith. Or believes that the institutions of this country have failed them uh, in some ways, and and lots of those grievances are you know legitimate. So in that in that milieu, you then have you know old legacy far right white supremacist groups who are pushing the envelope constantly, and then you have political actors um, like Trump and others who are uh, who are able to mobilize, crystallize, unite, and exploit those energies that are uh, that exist there already, and and point them in a direction. So. That I think is why you see that um, you know that this is not uh, it's not an argument that can be won with facts and evidence, right? I mean, this whole the whole narrative around uh, the 2020 election being stolen, time and again, it faces what appear to be on the surface to be sort of crippling defeats, right? The Arizona recount um, or audit, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, every single one of the cases brought by Giuliani and company being thrown out of court, those don't actually matter. Um, I mean, the, the the narrative that is feeding the social movement underneath it all, um, you know, survives and continues and reconstitutes itself and will continue, I think, until the the underlying, uh, um, you know, problems and sicknesses that feed this kind of movement are are addressed in a kind of more systemic way. And speaking about those uh, those lies and those narratives, this narrative uh, that the right wing media especially push, uh, still claiming that somehow or other Antifa uh, was uh, involved uh, in the insurrection. Could you talk about that and the importance of that to the narrative? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of amazing. And it, one of the things that is you know characteristic of you know authoritarian narratives and authoritarian politics in general is their ability to have completely contradictory ideas simultaneously held inside the same movement. So on the one hand, uh, you have people who say it was all it was all fake. It was a false flag operation. 
Antifa and Black Lives Matter dressed up as Trump supporters and organized this this whole like operation. And then inside the same same movement, shoulder to shoulder with them, you'll have an, inside the same person. Sometimes you'll also have the belief uh, that uh, the January six riders are are patriots um, and that they're being uh, crucified in these uh, uh, in these trials uh, that are just now beginning to happen against them. So those two contradictory ideas are are you know being held together. But the the creation of this sort of boogeyman on the left of uh, of um, Antifa and Black Lives Matter of turning them from, you know, what they are, like broad kind of social movements or tactics or whatever, turning them into um, this uh, communist conspiracy that is going to take over America, undermine it from the inside and destroy it. Um, like that, uh, that has been, you know, key to the reformulation of uh, of far right groups since Charlottesville. In fact, one of the things we explore earlier in the film is the way that Charlottesville um, launches this new kind of uh, political take for these movements. So we one of the guys we talked to in we interview in American Insurrection is Brian James, who's a lifelong hardcore leader in uh, white supremacist groups. You know, the Klan, the you know, the early militia movement where you met Tim McVeigh, uh, skinhead gangs. Um, and then uh, after Trump's uh, after Trump rode down the golden escalator and started his campaign, uh, uh, he said that he realized uh, that the more effective political move was to jettison the most explicitly racist politics and rebrand himself, take off the, the swastika armband, wrap himself in the American flag um, and become you know, a Trump supporter. So he joined the Proud Boys. He's a regional leader, regional leader of the Proud Boys in Indiana. Um, and he um, and he says, you know, that using rather than naming a racial enemy, saying, you know, we're against blacks or Mexican immigrants or whatever, uh, naming a political enemy, we're against the communists who want to destroy everything that you love about this country, uh, is was the, the way that they retargeted their political message so that they could reach into the mainstream, and it was incredibly effective. I mean, Brian James says that. Throughout his career in the far right, he's always had 20 guys in Minneapolis, you know, maybe 40 statewide. Now he has 200. We saw with our own eyes him in Washington, D.C., with a crew of former skinhead uh, gang members with, you know, tat racist tattoos on their faces uh, who were uh, dressed in yellow and black of the Proud Boys and were embraced by uh, a throng of, you know, mainstream Trump supporters. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're right, Juan. The, the creation of this leftist kind of uh, communist threat uh, to mobilize against, of that kind of enemy to mobilize against, is, is you know, central to um, the work that the extreme far right is doing to penetrate the mainstream.